Uh, there's been some discussions already um, about the idea of uh, people from here uh, writing to them in prison. Um, it is an incredibly powerful way of sending them solidarity and it is something which is being organised because it's also a way of saying that we, are, that we care about the people that, go in, that are sent to prison. Because if we don't do that and people go to prison, they will come out and they will walk away from the movements if they think that people don't care. So there's a concerted effort to try and get letters from all over the, all over the world sent to those um, three young men who are in prison now. Um, I have the details of uh, their, their, their names, the, the address and the prison numbers that are necessary to send in those letters. And there's a number of people here, including the person who asked the question, who has got uh, postcards that, we, uh, that, that are available and we would like to try and see if there are people here, both today and tomorrow, but maybe in the longer term, if we leave the details, to just, just send a letter in and say, we heard about your case and we're sending you solidarity because um, Having done letter writing for prisoners before, I can assure you it has a massive impact on people's morale and crucially on their ability, to, to their willingness to stay involved in the movement when they come out. On the international solidarity question, that's a, that's a really important one. Um, the, 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 the tabars, the, the, the orange bibs that we have here, have appeared on, on demonstrations before, but what's important is not just that there are observers on the day, but there is some form of, of backup and support for them. Um, and crucially, one of the lessons that came out from protests in, uh, particularly against the G20 protests in London in 2009, was the need for um, that legal support not to kind of disappear once the protests were over. So there was a decision made that there would be a permanent network of groups to do the to do legal legal monitoring of protests to retain that knowledge and that experience of people who've been out in the streets who know how what police tactics are can recognise what happens. Um, much of the training that we do is basic common sense. It would be, although the legal systems here and other countries are different, um, obviously the tactics of the police are going to be different. The task of documenting what they do is relatively straightforward. It doesn't change from one country to the next. I think it would be wonderful if there was an Italian version of Green and Black Cross. Um, and I think that the, the Green and Black Cross organisation, uh, who are one of, the one of the founding members of Netpol, would we'll be delighted to pass on resources and time and advice if that was something that people wanted to do. Um, on, oh, just one final point as well. I, I, I think the idea of, of wanting to take to take challenges to an international level is important. But um, one of the things that we've definitely found from from the experiences of using the evidence that's gathered at protests to support people who go to court is the, the poor quality of the evidence that's presented by the police. Police are just not very good at lying and they can't remember the lies that they've told. And if there's somebody there that has very effectively documented throughout the day the actions of the police, usually more than one person from different angles that, corroborate, that corroborates the photographs that may have been taken, this is what makes sure that people don't go to prison. This is the evidence that is vital to make sure that people stay, uh, have their convictions um, overturned if they are convicted. So, although I think the international dimension is important, the local is stopping people from being prosecuted in the first place is just as important too, and that comes from the, that, that comprehensive gathering of material that, on behalf of the movements, basically, rather than than on behalf of the police. The question about police informers is an incredibly complicated one. And there will always be police informers in social movements if they are in any way demonstrating any effectiveness. And one of the problems is, is that because you have such a mixture of people coming into a, a social movement or a campaign, 
um, that it's very difficult to be able to know who is a police informer, who isn't. Generally speaking, from the some of you will know that there was there's been some exposure of, of the use of undercover police officers against peaceful social movements in the UK. There is a public inquiry taking place at the moment on this issue. But the one thing that was clear is that the person the person who turned out to be the, the police informant was usually very popular and uh, very helpful and um, usually had a van so he could drive people around. It was never the person that, was, that people might think was the obvious person, the most disruptive person, because it's more subtle than that. Um, and one of the dangers is that if you become obsessed with trying to find the police informer in your ranks, you end up putting fingers at each other and do the job of, of destroying your own, own movement by becoming paranoid. Um, the solution to that is transparency and accountability in what you do, making sure that, that things like money and decisions are open and they're democratic, um, finding ways essentially to stop uh, the police from, from dividing one group of people against each other. I mean, that's the only advice that, that we can give, although there is a, a group that I work with called the Undercover Research Group who've done a very interesting 15 point points to look, look for. If, you, if, if somebody fits a number of these points, then it's at least worth exploring further. But they are based on the tactics of the British police. And they're going to be different from one country to the next. Okay. I don't have a, a huge amount to add on that. Um, but in, in reverse order, I think that the issue of police infiltrators, the, the kind of major revelations about that other stories broke just at the beginning, pretty, pretty s close to the beginning of the anti-fracking movement and it has undoubtedly affected people, um, it's made a lot of people very jumpy and it's also made it quite difficult for people from the outside to go in and find out what's happening, make, build, it, it just takes an awful lot of time I think certainly from an academic point of view to build up relationships with different groups so that you're able to be involved and that kind of links to the second question is that part of the kind of solidarity that's really good to see here is that there are you know academics involved in being useful and I think there is a role for academics, universities, scholarly work to contribute to the process of making sense of this but also to document what's going on um, as part of that that process to see yourself as uh, see academic work as part of the part of a movement, but th there is a need, I think, to, to start to join the dots, and I think that's where perhaps organisations like Netpol at a, a national level and the people like the Transnational Institute at an international level have a really important role to play in connecting these movements together so that we can share experiences but also so we can join the dots ourselves and help develop our understanding of what is what is going on and there's a, there's a function for academics as a small part of that perhaps. Awesome. Okay, try and answer that. I think this is a, um, a kind of 
theoretical conceptual work in progress to make sense of pacification, but I think there is a recognition that it's never a complete process and that it, it, it is, in, you know, historically, the, maybe it is more about the methods and the overall approach, but I think to think of it as being shaped at a kind of local level, the, the form that pacification takes in relation to the use of police power and in combination with the law. So there is a sense, a sense that it is, it is being shaped by, by the struggle. It's difficult because I think we see in, in relation to many people involved in, in the movement on the peripheries that we speak to lots of people who say, you know, this has had the desired effect. You know, I will restrict my political activism to letter writing and signing petitions because I don't want to go and get arrested or I don't want to go and get attacked by the police. So it, I mean, it has an effect in reproducing the idea of people wanting to take, to do their political action in a sanctioned form. But on the other hand, it, it has a very different effect to a lot of people involved in the movement, that it, it, it has a radicalising effect, that many people have come to this as, as you know, political novices who have never been involved in activism, that the attempt to pacify, the attempt to produce a kind of docile political protester has actually had, you know, it's been counterproductive and that the, the, the movement has grown with a dual focus, that there is an emphasis on the industry and the way that's backed by the state, but there's a, an explicit emphasis on the police. And people have told us in, in, our, in our research time and time again that their involvement in direct action protests has been motivated by the violence of the police. They wouldn't have got involved otherwise, or they maybe wouldn't have got involved as soon or in the way that they did, but it's in response to the state. But they, they see through the police the function of the state, and it has been a, you know, like Kevin said, it's a deeply traumatic experience for a lot of people, both in terms of facing the brutality, but also in their realisation of what the state is and what it does, and that has been profoundly traumatic with a lot of conversations with people, though they are deeply traumatised just by the, that change in recognition. But that has, that has radicalised people and it has galvanised the movement. So there is something, as a continuing work for, for scholars, to make sense of what, what effect does that have and where are the continuities historically with the ways in which pacification or attempts to pacify populations have been limited by struggle, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the answer. Um, in relation to the second question, I need to defer to lawyers in the room. I think I, I wouldn't want to do you a disservice by trying to answer that. Or I might pass over to my colleague. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not a lawyer either. Um, although I would say that um, regardless of what the laws are, there is also an obligation on states that are signatories to the European Convention on Human Rights to at least consider Articles 10 and 11, freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. Um, and although they are qualified rights, so they can be restricted by other conditions, other circumstances such as um, uh, public safety uh, and security, it is the obligation on the state to be able to show that it's at least considered um, not completely removing people's rights to be able to protest um, in, its, in their entirety. So, that is something I think that uh, some lawyers here would need to need to look into. I, I don't know anything about Italian law, unfortunately. I, I would certainly back up what Will said about the, the fact that pacification, in its efforts to try and restrict people's um, ability to protest, doesn't always win. But in the process of, of attempting to use repression to stop people from, from resisting environmental catastrophe or whatever it might be, um, it is forced to change track by the fact that people are radicalised by the process that they go through. Uh, it's really interesting that you've had, you know, I've seen support from elected representatives here, from, from the local mayor and from other villages. That is replicated in the UK. People who would never have been the sort of person who would ever even go on a protest are now evangelists for direct action and their, their parish and county councillors in, in Lancashire. That happened because they witnessed people that they know, their neighbours, their friends, um, people who often were their electorate, being brutalised. And I think that is likely to continue. That, that, that kind of experience of seeing what the state is capable of will put some people off, but also will encourage others to, to decide that they're going to do more. 